My name is Elia Locardi, and for the past seven years, I've been traveling the world photographing the most beautiful landscapes and cityscapes on the planet. Whether dealing with harsh weather conditions, challenging hikes, massive crowds of people, or hours out under the stars and night sky, each photograph I take presents its own unique challenges. In my video tutorial series, Photographing the World, I take you along for the ride and show you exactly how I capture each of these amazing world locations, as well as how I edit and post-process every photograph from start to finish. In this free lesson, I'll walk you through my workflow step by step as I shoot the famous Horseshoe Bend in Page, Arizona with the brand new Fujifilm GFX 50S medium format camera and the GF 23mm wide angle lens. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the tutorial, and welcome to Photographing the World. Hello everyone and welcome to Horseshoe Bend just outside of Page, Arizona. My name is Elia Locardi and today I'm going to walk you step by step through the process of shooting and editing images using the new GFX 50S camera and 23mm GF lens. I've been traveling the world with the crew from fstoppers.com creating a series called Photographing the World where we photograph some of the most beautiful destinations on the planet. I've been using the new GFX 50S camera and I thought Horseshoe Bend would be a beautiful place to teach you the strengths of working in medium format. Now Horseshoe Bend is a beautiful destination and as you can see it's also pretty busy. The nice thing is there is so much space out here for everybody to be able to get set up. You could literally have a thousand photographers up here and as you move from the left and right around this beautiful meandering river, the composition is beautiful. The other nice thing about this location is the sunsets right behind these mountains giving you the opportunity to capture a fiery sky over this incredible landscape. Let's go ahead and dive right into my composition here. Now again, I am using the 23mm GF lens. Now that, in full frame format, would be equivalent to 18 millimeters, so it's already pretty wide. But I also have a benefit working with medium format that I don't have with APS-C or full frame DSLR cameras, and that's the aspect ratio of four to three. Now, APS-C cameras and full frame cameras use three to two. Now, if you imagine three to two is already a little bit wide, four to three actually gives you more image, which allows you to get the most out of the millimeter of the lens that you're using. Now, let's take a look at a quick example. I'm gonna go ahead and shoot an image at four by three, the native format using the GFX, and I'm gonna do that using my trigger release cable right here. Let's review this image together. This is gonna be my composition for the sunset. Right now, everything's a little bit blown out, but as the sun starts to get lower in the sky, what I'm hoping is it's gonna illuminate those clouds and create a beautiful, fiery sunset over this landscape. But take a look at how much sky I have and how much of the lower foreground I have. This is the advantage of four to three. Now let's take a look at three by two. If you're used to shooting with the X-T2 or any of the Fujifilm cameras at APS-C or any full frame cameras, any DSLRs, you're gonna be used to this feature. If you go in the menu, the first option is image size. I have it set to four by three. Let's go ahead and set it to three by two and I'm gonna take another image reference. If we take a look at this three by two image now, you can see that I've cropped the top and bottom of the image. In fact, what I've actually done is crop the image. If you shoot with a medium format camera in its native four by three, you take advantage of the entire sensor and the whole megapixel range. If you change it to three by two, you're actually cropping and losing some resolution on the top and the bottom. So my recommendation, even if you're used to working with APS-C or full frame cameras, go ahead and change it and embrace using the four by three format. And in this case, it gives me a nice advantage because I like it better than two by three because it gives me more of the bottom and more of the sky while still maintaining all of the 18 millimeter aspect of this beautiful scene in front of me. 
The next thing I want to do is talk about my camera settings. I'm obviously shooting in RAW. I'm shooting at f8 in aperture priority mode at an ISO of 100. That way, as the sunlight starts to change, I can keep taking images, and the camera in aperture priority mode is automatically going to calculate my shutter speed based on the metering of the camera. And the metering is always perfect using the GFX 50S. Another thing that I'm doing is I am shooting five exposure brackets. Now, in order to enable exposure bracketing on the GFX, it's a button right on the top here. It's called Drive. When I press that button and go to drive, come down from single image or still image, two down to AE bracket, and I can say OK. Next thing I can do is press the button right on the front, the function key on the front of the camera. If I press that button, I can go to frame, steps, and setting, and I'm going to choose plus five frames at one stop, and I'm going to say OK again. Now the next thing that I'm going to do too, because I'm shooting into such a bright background, is I'm going to EV shift down. So I actually want to change this. If I left this natural at my metered exposure, I'd actually be getting the metered exposure zero, a plus one, a plus two, a negative one, and a negative two. What I actually want to do is I want to shift this down so instead, so I can capture the very bright background, I actually want to be able to get a zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, and a negative four. Now I'm going to go ahead and shoot these exposure brackets so we can take a look at the reason behind this. Let's take a look at this image sequence. First, the darkest image. Well, the darkest image, the negative four, you can see I'm still getting a really hot sun, but if we go up to a negative three, then a negative two, a negative one, and a zero, you can see that it brightens the foreground. Later, in post-processing, I'm gonna be covering how to manually adjust and blend these exposures together, but for now, it's very important that I capture every exposure range that I think I'm going to need, and whenever I'm shooting into the sun, I always wanna make sure that I expose for both the shadows and the highlights, that's very important. So far, I'm really happy with my composition. I know I'm gonna have to wait a little bit more time for that sun to come down and for the sky to hopefully light up with beautiful colors, but I already see some challenges. The main challenge, number one, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there are flies all over the place. They're swarming around me. These little flies don't bite, but they really like the front of the camera. They really like crawling around on the lens itself, so I know as I'm shooting this, I have a bunch of flies zipping through my frame, but thankfully in Photoshop, it's really easy to get rid of little spots like that, little flies in the frame, and I'm gonna walk you through that step by step if they happen to make it into my exposure. The other challenge I anticipate here is as the light changes, as that sun goes behind the horizon, it's going to, one, create a beautiful sky, which is a good thing, but it's gonna make the foreground much more dark. So I might have to adjust my exposure range a little bit and compensate with my EV shifting, but that's pretty easy to do on the fly because every time I shoot here, I can actually go through and review my images and make sure I captured everything that I need. But even still, I'm going to pay close attention to these exposures and make sure that I'm exposing correctly for the foreground and the background so I give myself everything that I need to put it together later in post-processing. Something to point out that's very important here is I am choosing not to use any neutral density filters, including a graduated neutral density filter. If I had a three-stop graduated neutral density filter, I'd be able to fix the exposure a little bit on the sky and require less bracketing, but I'd also get sort of a dark line on the horizon as that gradation messes with the landscape. And because I want to teach you guys everything about shooting and post-processing, I like the challenge of having to potentially blend multiple exposures together in post-processing to overcome the challenges if you don't happen to have any graduated neutral densities yourself. So the sun is just about to set behind the horizon, and as it was touching the horizon, I went ahead and shot a sequence of different f-stops so I could show you guys how that starburst changes as the f-stop increases. So let's take a look at the f8 shot first. And now at f8, you can see that the star lines are starting to exist a little bit, but watch what happens when we move up to f11. They become a little bit more defined. Now take a look at f16. Here we go. At F16, you can really start to see that starburst effect. Let's take a look at F22. Now F22, it becomes very intense, but just so I could show you guys all the ranges of this camera, I also shot one at F32. Check out the starburst at F32. Now that one's pretty intense and it's very, very defined. But something to point out with landscape photography in general, my comfort zone for shooting is typically around f8 to f11 because that's usually the sharpest point of the lens before anything like diffraction 
occurs. The other thing you have to be careful about is when you start to go past F11 into F16, F22, F32 for sure, you're gonna start to see every little speck of dust on your sensor. We're also shooting at a very fast shutter speed when we go up that high, and there are probably 10 billion little flies out there in front of this. So I have a feeling that if we use one of those shots at F22 or F32, we're gonna have a nightmare of flies to get rid of in Photoshop. That being said, I'm gonna base it clearly on the star that I like the most, and if F22 is the one that I wanna use, I'll find a way to clean up the scene and remove any problems with dust on the sensor and of course, flies in front of my lens. Now unfortunately, since I'm shooting right into the sun, something very negative happens too, and what happens is because the sun is hitting the front of the lens, it's creating not only that beautiful star effect, but also a glare too. So if we take a look at this image right here, you can see that there is a lens flare right in front of the frame. Now, I don't wanna spend time cloning that out in Photoshop, so to compensate for this, after I capture my star image, and I'm gonna do that one more time here, I'm gonna go up to F16 because that looks really nice with the edges of the star. I'm gonna shoot an additional set of exposures, but I'm gonna block the sun. And I'm gonna very carefully just put my hand up here, block the sun, and I'm gonna take these exposures again. Let's take a look at that shot without my hand. See that big lens flare? Now let's switch over to the shot with my hand in the frame. See how that now has taken that away. So the idea here is in post-processing, we can decide to do some additional blending. Use the sun or the top of the image with the sunburst, and on the bottom, what I can do is blend in the shot that had my hand. This brings up another interesting point. Another reason that I didn't want to use a neutral density filter is anytime I use a neutral density filter, any glass in front of the glass of my lens causes a potential for more flare from the sun. So this is very intense, and as you can see, when I shoot right into the sun, a flare happens right across the screen, but I don't get as many problems as if I have a piece of glass. Do so you think of that as a piece of glass in front is gonna have reflections and different refractions? It can cause all sorts of problems as well. So right now, I'm just gonna do it this way, and I'm gonna show you guys how to blend it in post-processing. So far, bear in mind, what I've been doing is I've been shooting here an hour before sunset to lock in my composition, make sure I get everything exactly how I want, everything's exposed properly, everything's focused, everything's perfect, so that I could capture the starburst before the sun set. But there was no guarantee that I was gonna have a starburst at all. What if these clouds were covering up the sun? Well, then the key to this shot would obviously be when the sun sets far enough below the horizon to light up the clouds. The reason I decided to shoot the sun was because it was purely optimistic. This shot may actually come out better with a starburst in it rather than the sky, because at this point, I'm not sure if that sky is gonna turn colorful. I certainly hope it does, but there's never a guarantee. But now that I've shot all the way through the late afternoon, I've captured all of the starbursts that I want, I've captured clean frames using my hand to block any flare on the lens, the next step is just to wait a little bit longer and see what the sky decides to do. And my hope is we're gonna get some beautiful colors and textures to capture. In the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and shoot every few minutes. Now, this whole time, I've made sure that the camera and tripod are rock solid. I've set this tripod up in a way where it's sitting, all of the feet are sitting in grooves in the rocks, nothing will slide, and of course, there's no chance that I'm gonna accidentally push it over the edge. Everything on this ball head, everything is completely locked down to ensure that as I start taking these shots, and again, I'm using a remote release cable, as I take these shots, nothing changes in between the shots. That gives me the opportunity to blend my exposure brackets together without any shift at all. So I'll end up with a seamless result and a beautiful image to share in the end. So the next step is just to wait this out and see what's gonna happen with the sky. I'm gonna go ahead and shoot every few minutes so we can take a look at the progression in post-processing. I think this is about the peak of the colors of the sky that I'm gonna to get tonight, so I'm gonna go ahead and take one more sequence of exposures right now. Honestly, I think the sky looks great. There's some really good color to work with, and I think we're really gonna bring this out in post-processing. So right now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pack things up because it's gonna get dark soon. Next time I see you guys, we're gonna take everything into post-processing. I'm gonna show you everything that I shot, and we're gonna talk about how to get the most 
out of editing these raw files using a combination of Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. Everybody. Welcome to the post-processing studio. Today I'm going to be walking you through step-by-step -step how to edit the photos that we captured together in Horseshoe Bend. Remember I shot these with the Fujifilm GFX 50S medium format camera and I shot everything in raw mode so we can take advantage of all of the best editing features in Adobe Lightroom. So let's get started by taking a look at Lightroom. I'm going to walk you through some of the basic features that I'm going to be using. If you're new to Adobe Lightroom, it's actually a great program to be able to catalog and edit your raw photos if you already use Adobe Lightroom. This is just going to be a little bit of a review, but I want to get us all on the same page. What I've done here is I've imported a selection of the photos that I shot. And what I mean by selection is I was there for a couple hours. I may have shot somewhere between 100 to 150 different images. But for this lesson, I just want to focus on the ones that we're going to be using and post-processing. So down here on the bottom, you can see all of those images that we're going to be looking at today. I'm currently in the Develop panel, but if I just click on the Library panel here, some different options are going to come up. If you're brand new to Lightroom, this is the panel where you do all of your importing. This is the button I hit to bring this selection of files into Lightroom. Once they're imported, this panel here on the right will show you all of the EXIF data. So you can see the size, the dimensions, the exposure time, focal length, ISO, and the make and model of the camera. So you can actually review everything that you shot. And if you set everything correctly in your camera, you'll actually get the correct date and time of the exposure here. Everything that we're going to be focusing on is actually in the develop panel. Now, while this develop panel has a lot of options, we're mainly going to be focusing on this panel here, which are the basic adjustments. We have the tone adjustments, exposure, contrast, highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. And then we have a little bit of stuff down here that we use clarity, vibrance, and saturation. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the selective adjustment tools. But before we start editing these images, I just want to show you guys a few of the things that I do to every Fujifilm file that I import. So right now I have one selected here. I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to change a few things. First thing I'm going to change here is sharpening. By default in Lightroom, it gives it sharpening of 25. Now this is a post-effect sharpening. Now these files are already razor sharp, so there's no reason to have Lightroom sharpen it anymore. So I'm going to take that down to zero. Second thing I'm going to do is go all the way down to this area called camera calibration. Now, if you're like me, you really like Fujifilm's color modes. And by default on the camera, it's set to Provia, which gives it a beautiful color tone. Inside of Lightroom, though, it's set to Adobe Standard, which isn't necessarily a problem, but it's not going to simulate the film style that you chose in camera. So what I'm going to do is click here where it says Adobe Standard. I'm going to go down and I'm going to set it to Provia. Now I want this to happen to all of my files. And you can see that it got a little bit more contrasty there, but it's hard to tell because this is a very dark frame. Since I've changed the sharpening, I've changed the camera calibration. What I'm going to do is right click on this image, go to develop settings, and I'm going to copy settings. So here, depending on how much you use Lightroom, this could have anything checked. So sometimes you can have everything checked or nothing checked. And this works in syncing anything in Lightroom, whether it's color settings, process versions, different things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to select process version, and I'm just going to select the things that I changed. In this case, it was sharpening, and it was also the calibration. So those are the only two things that I changed. I'm going to copy them here. Next thing I'm going to do is select all of these images. I'm going to do that with a hotkey, command since I'm on a Mac, command A, control if you're on a PC, control A, select everything, right click, develop settings, and I'm going to paste those settings. Inside of Lightroom, you can see I get this little plus minus icon on the lower right. That means that everything has been synced. And just to make sure, if I scroll up here back to sharpening, if I thumb through any of these files, you can see that that sharpening is set to zero. 
So we're all on the same page again. Before I get into editing these specific photos, I want to talk a little bit about editing raw files in Adobe Lightroom. So let's take a look at this post sunset. Now remember, in the field, I shot directly into the sun. And I'm going to be showing you guys every step that I shot into the sun, whether that was f8, f11, 16, 22, or above 22. But right now, just so I can show you the differences and how to get the most out of these raw files, let's take a look at these five bracketed exposures. Now, this was after the sun already set. You can see that's a negative two. This is a negative one. This is the metered exposure. If I didn't have exposure bracketing on, this is what would have come out through the camera. You can see that I still have some problems in the shadows. It's really dark, and that sky is already really blown out. Going up to plus one and plus two here, you can see that now I'm starting to get more of a proper exposure for the foreground or the shadows in this case, but the highlights are really blown out. Now with raw processing, you have the ability to push and pull the data both in the highlights and in the shadows. Now sometimes we call that recovery or recovering shadows and recovering highlights. The great thing about raw files, especially the Fujifilm GFX 50S, it's medium format, big sensor, lots of data, we can actually pull a few stops in either direction. Now bear in mind this is a very extreme situation. It's an extreme situation because I'm literally shooting directly into the sun or the brightest portion of the sky since it's completely backlit. So you can see here, all the way at negative two, I have the correct exposure for the sky or the highlights. All the way here at plus two, I have a better exposure for the foreground. So we're going to kind of have to meet in the middle. And what I want to do is try to get this in a single exposure. I shot bracketing so I could show you this example in post-processing, but my main goal in post-processing is to always use the least amount of exposures possible. So let's just take a look at a quick example. Let's say that I shot a single exposure out of camera. Now using the develop panel here, I'm just going to make some simple adjustments. Let's say to exposure. Right now we know we can all agree that that sky is blown out. Well, can I recover it? Can I recover that much of a difference in the sky? Well, let's start by just changing the exposure. If I go down to the left, you can see that the sky does start to get a little bit better. But as I start to move a little bit more to the left, you can see it's looking all right. I'm going to move down to the highlights. I'm going to pull the highlights down. And you can see it is correcting pretty much everything if you look where my mouse is here above this area. But right here in the center, and I'm going to zoom in, you can see that I still have some big gaps missing. Now that's because this can't be recovered. And if I reset this one here, I'm just going to put this back to zero really fast. You can see that there is a lot of data missing in the sky. So I went almost three stops there and you can see that I can recover two stops very comfortably. But when I go past that, this area starts to look a little bit gray. So what I'm going to do is go on the reverse end. So that's pretty powerful though. I was already able to cover nearly two and a half stops. But what if I went down instead, all the way to the bottom, when the highlights are completely intact. How much can I recover from the shadows as opposed to the highlights? So first thing I'm going to do is ramp that exposure up. Let's try to bring it up around three stops. So it looks pretty good. I'm also going to bring up the shadows. Not too bad. I'm not going to worry about the highlights right now, but what I want to do is try to simulate my overexposed image, my plus two. So I'm going to bring this down a little bit. And I'm actually going to take a look at this. And I'm going to command click this image and hit the right arrow on my keyboard. I'm just going to toggle in between. So there you go. This is the adjusted one here. This was the negative two exposure. And then you can see there was a little bit of a uh, laggy thing happening on the screen. But now that it's rendered here, you can see this one, all the detail here. And you can see this file here. You can see there's not a whole lot of difference. So right off the bat, what I wanted you guys to learn from that is you can usually, in most cameras, and this camera particularly, you can actually recover more from the shadows than you can with the highlights. When you start to pull the highlights back a little bit too much, let's say we were working with this file, if we really pulled that exposure down, you can see that I'm not actually going to get anything back in those whites. It's actually just going to become gray and a little bit washed out. Whereas if I'm in the shadows and I'm in a situation where I need to recover more in the shadows, when I pull the shadows up, I'm able to retain most of that detail. Now, if I go too much past two to three, up to four stops, this will end up getting a little bit grainy. And in that situation, you may want to go up to a different exposure. So let's begin editing the photos themselves. First thing I want to do before then is I'm just going to reset these settings for later. So when we come back, they'll be ready to go. So the first thing, let's take a look 
at the starbursts themselves. I'll come back to my hand blocking the sun a little bit later. I'm going to pick each exposure here. This is a plus one exposure in the bracket series. And I'm just going to command click through these to show you all of the versions. In the previous section of the video, we did talk a little bit about it, but it's really nice to see it here on screen. Let's start at the beginning. This is going to be, and you can read it right up here, this is F8. So you can see the starburst at F8. If I arrow to the right, we're going to see F11. If I go one more time, we're going to see F16. You can really start to see how defined this is. And then from F16, I can go to 22. And from 22, I can go all the way up to 32. Not all lenses go up to F32. This one does. A lot of lenses do stop at F22. But between 22 and 32, the star doesn't change too much. I do like this one. It has some really nice lines in it. 22 looks pretty good. And to be honest, my favorite is 16. And I even kind of like 11. I like that it's soft. So the first thing that I want to do is identify which starburst I want to use. And when I'm in the field, I like to shoot them all because looking in post-processing, it definitely tends to look a little bit different. You may find that in the field, on the back of the tiny LCD screen, in the sun, it's hard to see the detail. But once you're in post, you can see everything. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to decide that we are going to use the F16 version for the shot. Now let's really dig into this. Now I've made this one green here in the center because this is my neutral exposure. I was looking at these a little bit earlier today. And I did that by just right clicking and setting set color label to green. That's just so I know no matter where I am, if I had 3,000 images in here, it's easy to visually recognize where this scene is. So right now, same situation with the exposure. You can see the sky is fairly well exposed, a little hot on the horizon, but we are shooting into the brightest object known to man, the sun. So of course that's going to happen. But you can also see that just like the other scene that I showed you guys, extreme lighting situation. So this is all dark. So let's go up in exposure. So if I go up in exposure to a plus two, you can start to see this being well exposed in a way, but also very washed out. So you have to be careful when you're shooting right into the sun because you can tend to wash the scene out. Most importantly, I want to show you all this. So we have this as a lens flare. Here's the starburst. That looks pretty good. But notice all this. This part of the lens flare doesn't look really nice. I don't like this sunspot. And you can see, just if I do this really quick, quickly, if I pull the shadows up, you can see on the left, you can see all of these little dots. See that red mark right there? I know I've zoomed in quite a bit. But now that I've done that, you can see this huge array of just, it's a mess. It's because that light is hitting the front of the lens and sort of refracting off of it, causing these elements. So what I've actually done, and let's just go ahead and put this back. We're going to go to the other scene. Now remember when I was in the field, what I did was I shot the starburst and then in order to block the light in front of the camera, I put my hand in front of it. So I'm going to go ahead and select that as well. And if I toggle back and forth between the sun flare and my hand shot, you can see that, wow, the foreground looks really clean. I'm going to do that one more time. Pay close attention here and also the lens flare itself. It's like a night and day difference. You can see how washed out this area is, all of these things reflecting off the lens. So the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to balance both of these exposures. And I'm going to start with this layer right in the middle. Let's say that we only shot one exposure. We didn't have any exposure brackets. I'm going to use this as a base. And then after I have this nice and balanced, I'm actually going to combine these two together in Photoshop to take advantage one of the beautiful flare of the sun, the starburst here and also the clean frame that I was able to achieve by blocking the sun and keeping the lens from hitting the front of the glass. So let's go ahead and get started by picking the metered exposure with the F11 Starburst. Now, just like the example I showed in the beginning of this post-processing lesson, the reason that I'm picking the middle exposure is I know that this is way too underexposed and this is way too overexposed. So one, if I was using this one, I couldn't get the sky back. And I know if I was using this one, it'd be very difficult to bring all of that back. You can see on the histogram here, the shadows, midtones, and highlights, everything's pushed over on the left-hand side, which means that the shadows are very clipped and stacked. And on this one, you can see that it's pushed over on the right. So I'm starting right in the middle. I'm going to have to push and pull a little bit. But the first thing I want to do is bump the overall exposure. So let's go ahead and bring that up a little bit. Right around there. Let's say 1.25. Next thing I want to do is start bringing the shadows up. We'll bring these up a little bit too. Let's bring that 
up. So this is nice because here on the exposure I can independently control the entire thing. It's kind of like grabbing the middle and you can see if I do grab the middle here, the histogram, I can move from left to right and get a visual reference of that slider moving with the histogram. The shadows here allow me to just tweak the shadows and if you're ever curious what you're actually selecting here in Lightroom, you can just highlight it and it'll show you the slider that it corresponds to. So here I'm bringing the shadows up which further corrects it and I'm also going to give it just a little bit more contrast because I know that's going to match my other image. What I've done here is I've done global adjustments. So I'm just tweaking it just a little bit and what I mean by global is when I use these sliders here it actually affects the entire image. But here's what I've done though is I've moved the exposure up, I've moved the shadows up, but I've also blown out the highlights by doing so. If I were to pull the highlights down here, I could correct that sky, but I don't like the way this is starting to look. So what I'm going to do, instead of using a global adjustment, I'm going to use a gradient selective adjustment. These are really easy to use. It's this option right here is the gradient tool. I click the gradient tool. I'm going to create a new one just by clicking and dragging. So the first part I click, you can see that it'll allow me to grab and create a gradient. If I hold the shift key, it will lock it to 90 degrees here so I get a perfectly linear gradient. I'm going to stop it here right below the mountain. Now it doesn't look like much yet but if I change the exposure here you can see now I'm getting an even change from the top of that gradient all the way to where it terminates and as I move it you can see that it's affected inside the confines of these two lines above the center of the gradient marker. So let's go ahead and reset that and start over. So obviously the first thing I want to do is I definitely bumped that exposure up a lot so what I'm going to actually have to do here is pull it down in the sky and I'm going to do this sort of subject to taste and as I do it I'm also going to make small adjustments here. The other thing that I want to do is go ahead and pull the highlights down just a little bit so I can get some of the blue sky back and to compensate here while I'm doing that I'm actually sort of affecting the horizon and I can fix that by actually changing the shadows and sort of pull that accidental vignetting that I'm getting on the sky. So it's pretty simple. We're just doing some quick adjustments here just to offset the damage I did to the highlights. Now remember, since this is a raw photo, as I slide this stuff around, it's basically a nonlinear workflow. I can change any of this at any time it's saved into my Lightroom file. Before I go to Photoshop, I can make sure everything's perfect. And just like I've slid the highlights all the way to the right by bumping the exposure, that doesn't mean I can't get them back by sliding it back to the left using selective adjustments. Working in RAW gives you the greatest power and flexibility over the files, colors, and contrast itself. Now that that's set, any final adjustments I'm going to go ahead and make. I definitely want that sun to stay bright, but I definitely also want to see some of the sky itself. Maybe not quite that much, just to make it a little bit more realistic. I'm going to click on the gradient tool again just to close out of that, go back to global mode, and I'm just going to slide over here to the left and I'm going to select the shot that I'm going to be using. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to use the plus one exposure here rather than this one, the plus two, because I feel like this area here is very blown out, while this still has some room to work with. So to match the other exposure, what I'm going to do is just bring this up and make some small adjustments here somewhere around there and I'm also going to bring the shadows up. Now when I think I have something close, what I'm actually going to do since the other one is still selected, I'm just going to toggle over there and see if I'm close or not. So what I need to do is first select this one here, go back here, command select, I'm just going to hit the right arrow and we can see if that's pretty close. Now obviously they're way different. You can see that this one with that flare on the foreground looks completely different. But what I'm trying to do is just get a basic read for the luminance itself. Let me make some more adjustments here. Pull the highlights down just a little bit. Check that one more time. And that actually looks pretty close. Let's take this down a little bit more to darken it up and I think that's perfect. So now that these are pretty much balanced in luminosity, they're pretty close to the same, aside from that lens flare itself, it's time to bring them into Photoshop. Now before I go into Photoshop, I just want to point out that there are many different ways to get your files into Photoshop from Lightroom, but I'm going to be using a very specific way that I like for my workflow. The most common way though is to select the image or images, right click and then say edit in Adobe Photoshop. Now what that's going to do is it's going to automatically export your file 
and open it as a PSD or whatever your preferences are set to in Photoshop and allow you to edit it. Now that's great, but what it also does is it imports that PSD back into Lightroom itself. Now I don't want that to import back into Lightroom, so I'm going to do it a different way. I'm actually going to export this and bring it into Photoshop. So I'm going to go to export and the export command. I'm just going to walk you through this. Now I have a folder called temp or temporary where I put all these files and once they're in Photoshop I save them as something else. So if you want to save this or name the file you can do that all right here. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm setting it to be a PSD because I'm going natively into Photoshop. Pro Photo RGB which is the widest color gamut we have available here and I'm also using 16 bits. From there I am not doing any sizing on this image, any sharpening, anything else for that matter. The only thing that I'm doing is under post-processing and that's open in Adobe Photoshop CC 2017 and I'm going to click export. Once I do, it's going to export that file. It's going to open Photoshop because I believe Photoshop was closed and we're going to have a look at this file. Well, bear in mind, the larger the file, the longer it takes. This is a medium format camera and it is 51 megapixels, so it tends to take a little bit longer to open than the X-Series cameras at 24 megapixels. So there we go. Photoshop is open. I'm just going to do a Command-0 to full screen this image and I'm going to go back into Lightroom. Inside of Lightroom, here's my first file. I'm actually going to go over to the other one that I want to import, which is this one right here. Do the same thing. Right click. Go to the export mode. But instead of doing export, I'm going to export with previous. And when I do export with previous, it's going to take all of the settings from export, but it's going to bypass opening the panel so I don't have to click the export button. Okay, here we are in Photoshop again. Now essentially I have two files. I have the one with my hand over the sun and I have the one with the sun in frame. So what I'm going to have to do is combine and merge these files. Now again, there are other ways to do this. There are ways to do it to load them as a stack from Lightroom, but I'm going to do it my favorite way and that's with a collection of hotkeys. It's actually a sequence of hotkeys. What I need to do is select all first on a Mac is Command A for select all and I'm going to copy. Copy and paste is probably the most commonly used keyboard shortcuts for every application. So that's Command C and I'm actually going to do a Command W which is close. And now that this file is open because I closed the other one, I'm going to do a Command V for paste and there you go. Now I have two layers. Now remember in the field when I said my tripod never moved between frames? Well, this is going to become very important in this scenario because the version underneath, the version with the sun flare, is in the same position as the one with my hand over it. So as I toggle this on and off, nothing changes about the scene except for the scene itself. In other words, nothing moved. These rocks are in the same place. Every line, every chiseled edge, every piece of detail is in the exact same spot and ready for blending. So let's take a look at that again. We have the background here. I'm going to double click on it to turn into a layer. And then we have our layer that we want to replace part of the foreground. Now a couple things are going on here and I just want to zoom in a little bit so we can take a look. One, remember those flies I was talking about? They are everywhere and we're going to have to do something about that. But two, I have two images that are not usable by themselves. This one looks great, but it has all of this stuff, all of these issues in the foreground. And this one, well, obviously we can't use it because my hand's in frame. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mask in a portion of this clean image on the bottom while leaving the sky from the other frame. So again, if you're new to this, if you're new to Adobe Photoshop, don't panic. This is actually pretty simple masking. So what I'm going to do here on this layer is I'm going to create a mask. If this is the first time you've ever created a layer mask, all you have to do is select the layer and click the Create New Mask tool. Now masking is very simple and let me just explain how it works. Whatever is white on this mask is visible. Whatever is black ends up becoming invisible. So for example, if I put a big square with a rectangular marquee and I actually filled this mask with black inside of that square, you can see that it would create a window. So I basically have cut out that portion of that image. Now it's better than actually just cutting the image itself on a layer because masks are nonlinear. In other words, I can change it, manipulate it, or just throw it away if I mess up. So what I want to do is I want to keep most of the bottom of the image. So what I'm going to start by doing is creating a gradient. That gradient is going to be based on white to black. So you can see this is my foreground and background. As I swap that, you can see it's black to white or white to black. I can do either way, but what I want to do here is I want to make sure that this 
part of the layer. This layer that's on top is visible here on the bottom. So in other words, this bottom part of the mask needs to be white and it needs to fade in just to where my fingers are because I don't want my fingers to be in there at all. So what I'm going to do is click and drag just like the gradient tool inside of Lightroom. If I hold shift, it'll lock it to 45 degree angle so I get a perfect linear line. I'll let go and you can see that I have instead of just this, now I have this. So that's actually getting there. That's starting to look good, but it's not exactly complete. Remember that area that I was talking about, those problems on the foreground here? Well, you can see that they're still there because they're part of that image. And you can see as I start to add more of this image, if I disable this mask, you can see that they disappear. So now what I'm going to do is a little bit of local adjustment, and I'm going to do that using the brush tool. So the brush tool is over here. You can click on it or you can hit B on the keyboard. And I'm actually using a Wacom stylus here. So I have a special set of hotkeys for the Mac bound to one of my buttons here, my thumb button. And what that actually is, is control, option, and click. And you can see if I click and drag to the left, my brush size gets smaller. To the right, it gets larger. If I click and drag and go up, it gets softer down, it gets harder. So again, you can do that just by holding control option on the keyboard, but I'm actually doing it here on the stylus with an express key. So this is a really powerful way to be able to change the brush size on the fly. Now I'm painting with flow here and my flow is set to 10% and what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to start painting white here. And if I show the mask, I just want to show you this is actually what I'm doing. I'm just painting white on this mask. A white is visible, so what I'm able to do is kind of clean up all of these areas. You can see I'm cleaning all that up here, cleaning that up, getting rid of some of that ugly stuff that ended up in my frame. Another thing I might want to do is get rid of this. I may also, and this is purely a style choice of how you want this to look, some of this as well. Maybe this spot here. And of course, I'll zoom out just a little bit, all of this over here. And this is just going to take just a few more minutes, just a little bit of painting here, just a little bit of painting here. And I want to make sure that what I do not do is actually paint out areas where my fingers are. That would mess the whole thing up. So I just have to be careful and avoid those areas. But everything else, nothing else is off limits. Any part of this image, especially the areas that had the biggest amount of problems in the foreground. All right, that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and back off of this here. I'm going to hit Command-0 just to show the whole scene. And I'm going to toggle it on and off. Now before I go any further on this image, what I actually want to do is go back to Lightroom. And I'm going to reset the original file. By reset, it means I'm just going to go ahead and delete this gradient. go back to the global adjustments. And what I'm going to do is just kind of manually reset this really quick because I want to look at the before and after and the progression of how we've been building this image. So the same way, I'm going to get this into Photoshop by right-clicking, export, and export with previous. Since I have exported this before, it's going to ask me if I want to overwrite it or use unique names. I'm going to use a unique name. Once again, this is in Photoshop. I'm going to do Command A for select all, copy for copy, Command W for close, and I'm going to paste this in and move it to the bottom. So I just want to show the progression here. We started with this. We ended up doing some adjustments inside of Lightroom to take it to there, which is already pretty extraordinary. Then we've used another exposure with my hand blocking the sun to get to here. Now that our basic blend is built, it's time to address something that's, uh, well, I'm not going to lie, a little bit annoying. So remember all those bugs that were in the scene? Let's go ahead and zoom in and see just what an impact they made. So see all these streaks, all those hot streaks, especially in front of here. You see all those? It's amazing. These are all little, I don't know if they were sand flies or they didn't bite, so they weren't sand flies, but they were some type of swarming desert fly. And because this camera is such a high megapixel, I don't think if I was shooting with my iPhone I would have seen all these. Since it's high megapixel, we see every single one. So I'm not going to lie. This is going to take a little bit of time, but it is very simple. So what I'm going to do first is show you the technique to get rid of annoying little things like this. doesn't just work for desert sand flies. It also works for dust spots in the sky on your sensor or any little artifacts you need to get rid of in the scene. First thing I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to create a fresh layer. If you've never created a layer before, 
that's right here. We're going to click on it to create a blank layer. That way, when I do any painting, cloning, or healing, it applies to that layer, and I can always delete it if something goes wrong. I don't want to apply it to one of these layers just in case I need to go too far back in history and I can't get the clean result I had before. So right now, on a fresh layer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt something first, the easy way. Let's try the easy way. And that's the heel brush here. So right here, the heel brush, I'm going to go ahead and click on it. I'm going to make sure it's set to content aware. Now the same thing here, I can change the brush size. I suggest using a harder edge brush for this. And what I'm going to do is just sort of paint over these. So if I start painting here, 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 you can see that because this is a lot of detail here, uh, it's pretty good at picking it up and fixing it, even over these edges. So this works really well. I actually have to go in and zap out every single one of these little things that I find. Now, if the heel brush is not doing it for you, if it, if it creates some sort of problem, uh, replaces texture improperly, you can use the clone stamp. The clone stamp is here. Now, most people would rather use the heel brush than the clone stamp. Clone stamp works a little bit different. By holding the Option key, you can select an area by clicking on it. And then when you move over and paint, you can actually paint that area back into the scene. So this is kind of an extreme example. I'm taking that crack and putting it here. If I undo that and I actually pick something like this, you can see that I can paint this out as well by just painting similar texture around it. So my advice is to start by using the heel brush until it doesn't work and then use the clone stamp. Now this is a tremendous amount of work. Now obviously if you're posting something to Instagram, you probably don't need to go through the trouble, but I want to actually go through the trouble and remove all of these so they don't become distracting later. But rather than make you sit through me cloning out every single one of these, we're just going to speed up the process. So I'm going to go ahead and start now. All right, and just like that, after about 10 minutes, I believe, 10 minutes, I was able to remove, and I'm just going to zoom in here, thousands of these little flies as I toggle that on and off. I also did a style choice here. I like the, the burst of the light, but I didn't really like some of the lens flare. So you can see if I just toggle this on and off. I dampened. I didn't get rid of it completely. I used the clone stamp to sort of just soften those hard edges of those um, octagon, so to speak, from that lens flare. The other thing that I want to address before I move on, and this is a great example to show how the clone stamp works, is if we look at this globally, you can see these little rocks on the lower left. I find that very distracting. So what I want to do with this layer and using the clone stamp, select the clone stamp, is I want to actually just paint these out. Now I'm using a very low flow, which is going to give me a light opacity, and what I'm going to do is select some of this green space down here, and I'm just going to move down. You can see that as I roll over it, it's going to show me exactly where it's going to paint that. And as I press down, this is a pressure sensitive stylus that I'm using here in my right hand. It allows me to paint just like a paintbrush. So I can just reference some areas that are similar, like this dark area here. You can see that I can just put that right down here. Well, cloning things out like this is very simple because this is a repeatable pattern. It doesn't have any real form or function other than being green, having some rocks and some moss on the edge. In other words, it's not like a building or a car or a person or something that's really hard to replicate. Really, this is just color and texture. And as long as I match it as close as possible, nobody's ever going to notice that those rocks were there to begin with. I'm not going to speed up through this one because it's really fast. And it's a good example of removing distractive elements. Like I find these to be a little bit more distracting than useful. If I had rocks all the way around the composition on both sides, they'd kind of be leading lines. But these are just tiny little rocks in the foreground. Zoom out on that a little bit. Now we have our blended shot. So at this point, what I want to do is just go ahead and move these into a folder to get a little bit more organized. And I'm just going to name this blend. The other thing I'm going to do is just save this in the background just in case something happens. Remember, these are huge files, so I want to make sure I don't lose the work that I've already created. Now from here, from Blend, what I'm actually going to do is create a new layer from this folder. And to do that, I'm just going to drag it to the Create New Layer, and I'm going to now have a duplicate of it. And I can do one of two things. I can use the hotkey to merge this together, or I can actually go through here and use one of the options here. So it would be Merge Group, or what I usually do is just press Command E. Pressing Command E is going to turn this into a group 
for a folder of multiple layers and just going to compress it into a single layer. And the reason I wanted to have this as a single layer is now that everything's blended together, I want to do some additional editing. I want to warm up certain areas. I want to change the contrast, maybe tweak the highlights a little bit. And I'm going to do that using up here under filter, the camera raw filter. So I'm just going to go ahead and click right there. The Adobe Camera Raw Filter inside of Photoshop is pretty much the exact same tool set that you have in Adobe Lightroom, but it looks a little bit different. You can see it has a little bit more color here. Some of the icons are a little bit different, but for the most part, it's exactly the same. In fact, any adjustment that you make here is going to give the exact same effect. The biggest difference being we are now in Photoshop. We are no longer in RAW. So inside of Lightroom, I did all the broad strokes, the big adjustments of shadows and highlights. Here now, all I'm doing is fine tuning the image. Since I changed the shadows so much and the highlights, I managed to remove some of the contrast. So I'm just going to bump the contrast up a little bit. And you can see that happening. The other thing is I feel that even though it was shot using Provia, which is pretty contrasty in the camera for the film simulations in Fujifilm cameras, I feel like it could use a little bit more vibrance. Now, you don't want to take the vibrance up all the way. You can see that that's a mistake, but just pulling it up a little bit, pop some of the blues, reds, and greens out just a little bit more. Now, what I really want to focus on too here is if I go all the way over to the FX panel, I have a lot of options, but my favorite here is dehaze. What dehaze actually does is it calculates the depth of a scene. When you look at an infinite scene, you have foreground, middle ground, and background. Now that is represented here based on the horizon being shades of the atmosphere. So you can see if you can imagine looking at a mountainscape and those mountains getting more blue and lighter blue as they get further and further and further away from your vision. That actually is the depth of a scene. So dehaze calculates that and adds contrast. So you can see as I start to do that, I add contrast in those varying degrees. So those were all global settings. Now what I want to do is adjust the foreground as independent from the background being the sky itself. So here I'm going to use a selective gradient tool and I'm going to click again and you can see it's almost the same but it has a green for the start and a little red circle for the end. So I'm going to start and end right about here and you can see that I also have some settings intact. When you create one it's going to remember the last settings that you had used so what I'm going to do is click up here to this little flyout, and I'm going to say reset local correction settings. Biggest thing I want to do here is address the warmth of this image. I feel that it's a little bit too purple, a little bit too cool. So what I'm going to do is bring the temperature up because it is really being illuminated by the sun itself. So you can see as I start to do that, it brings back some of the red in the rock and I can actually bring this up a little bit higher to compensate. The other thing I'm going to do is pull the shadows up a little bit more here. So you can see that I'm going to bring the overall brightness of the scene up just a little bit. What I also might want to do is pull the blacks up just a hair just to get a little bit more luminance in the foreground. I'm going to make some other adjustments. I may want to add a little bit of a tint. This is sort of a hue shift into the magenta just to give it a little bit more of that warm pink value. So it's going to basically start to bring this alive. Now I'm not going to use any of the clarity or dehaze or the saturation or you know what? Scratch that. Let's use a little tiny bit of dehaze just to add some deep contrast in the foreground. Well that's starting to look pretty good. So some minor adjustments here and I think we're pretty close to something that's looking pretty good. I've addressed the foreground here, warmed it up. Now let's go ahead and do the same thing with the sky. And when I create a new gradient you can see it's retained all of those settings. You can see it's crazy warm. Not exactly what I want. So what I'm going to do is just create the gradient here right on the sky. And what I really want to do for this one, and this is going to be a little bit different. Since I've warmed up the scene before, let me go ahead and change this. I'm going to reset it. I kind of want to cool down the sky. So right now I have all of this warmth coming from the sun, illuminating the foreground itself, but I also want some blues. So I have some differentiation in the color tonality of the image. And I'm going to do that by going the opposite spectrum. Instead of warming the temperature with the sky selected, I'm just going to cool it a little bit. So you can see that I get that blue back in the sky. I want to go ahead and adjust this a little bit accordingly so I get the right amount here. I also might want to bring the shadows up just a hair in the sky 
And if you want to try it, you can always add a little bit more dehaze. And what dehaze will do, and you can see I went a little overboard there, it'll make that blue much more dramatic. So that, again, subject to taste, depending on how contrasty and saturated you want your blues. What I can tell you, though, is if you use dehaze and you end up with a little bit of vignetting or some darker spots around the edge of the sky, you can always offset that just by pulling up the shadows a little bit. That usually compensates for it and gives you better tonality all the way through without any accidental vignetting. I think this looks pretty good. I'm going to go ahead and apply it by just saying OK. The more you do, the longer it'll take to render, and it's going to apply it to the scene itself. So if I turn this off and on, you can see what we had underneath, and now you can see what we have as a result. Now that's starting to look pretty good. At this point, it's time to take this image a little bit further. I'm just going to do one or two more little things, and then we're going to move on to the next image and take editing just a little bit further. But after this, after we blended everything together in Lightroom, moved everything into Photoshop, created the base blend, I've done some global and local adjustments using the Adobe Camera Raw filter. Now, if I wanted to do any more adjustments, what I could do is use the next set of tools, which are called adjustment layers. So these give you controls over every aspect of the contrast, the color, the saturation of your image. But the best thing about adjustment layers so if I were to create a curves layer here, it comes in with a mask, and I can turn it on and off, delete it, start over, or just selectively apply it. For example, if I wanted to brighten up this image even more, and I'm just going to do that with a gamma here. If I do that, you can see it brightens up the whole image. But what if I just want to brighten up the foreground, or more specifically, the lower part of the foreground? Well, since this adjustment layer has a mask, I can do the same thing with a gradient and just paint it from white here to black. And now this new color correction, this curves layer, will just happen in the area that I've selected for the mask. And if I hit the backslash key on the keyboard, enters ruby lith mode, which basically shows everything that's masked out as a magenta hue. So you can see that I only have the bottom of the image here that has that effect applied. So if I wanted to add more contrast, I could do that here too, brightness and contrast. And I could change just the contrast. But if I didn't like the contrast I was getting here in the yellow and the sky, what I could do is be a little bit more dramatic with it. And I could draw a gradient from here to here. And then I just get the contrast in the bottom. And I can make the adjustments. From here, there are definitely more steps we can take. But I want to go ahead and get into editing the next file. But first, let's go ahead and wrap this one up by taking a look at everything we did step by step. So I'm going to go ahead and expand everything here. So you can see it started really simple as one layer here inside of Lightroom, but you can see it was really dark. This is a single exposure. By making adjustments in Lightroom to the shadows and the highlights, global and selective, we went from here to here. After that, we got rid of the annoying lens flare and changed it to this. Then we addressed all of those little flies. If I zoom in here, you can see all of those little flies disappeared. And from there, what we did is a nice color shift adjustment and then some fine tuning here. So if we take a look at this, we've actually gone from start straight out of camera to finish. So we've actually been able to push this very far. Here we are back in Lightroom. Now it's time to go back to the beginning, the one that I showed the raw adjustment examples on. But this time, we're going to edit the photo and bring it into Photoshop. So just like I explained before, if we take a look at the overexposed file, we know that I can't get that sky back. It's not going to happen. And we also know that I probably don't want to go too far here to try to get the shadows out, because that's going to be further than four stops. So the other thing, with the last file, I picked the neutral exposure, the metered exposure out of the camera. If I would have had bracketing off, that's what the camera would have shot. If I try that here, I can go up to the sky and I can see if I can actually bring this back. But I feel like this area here, it's still too hot. So this exposure may not work for me. What I'm actually going to have to do is go to the negative one. So this is a good example when bracketing really comes in handy. For most scenes, the lighting is not going to be this extreme, and certainly not just in this little area. If you have overexposure warnings set on your camera, it may not even pick up this tiny area. So I tend to shoot, instead of just one shot, three to five exposure brackets just in case, just in case I need to go one stop under or one stop over depending on the severity and intensity of the light. So here's a good example of that. I believe that I can get the shadows back from this and also retain the highlights that are missing. So first thing, let's bring that exposure up. Let's bring it way up 
let's go past two stops because we know we can do that with this camera. The other thing I want to do is just go ahead and bring up the shadows globally. Well, it's already starting to look pretty good. And sometimes I like to use even numbers just to make it easier to read. So 2.25 and 30 in the shadows makes it nearly three stops of recovery in the shadows themselves. Next step is to create a new gradient here. And I'm just going to do that by selecting from the top to the bottom, holding shift and moving this around. Now, obviously, I'm going to have to compensate, get that exposure back. Let's bring that down and also the highlights themselves. So let's go ahead and pull the highlights down. Let's get back some of that detail. And this is going to take a little bit of adjustment just to get it just right because I want to be able to pull those highlights back, but I don't want to overdo it if I don't have to. And as I am doing this, you can see that I'm also darkening up the horizon itself. So if I go too far, you can see that the horizon is getting darker. So after I balance the highlights the way that I want them, which I'm being very careful here, you can see that I've darkened some of the horizon and some of the top of the sky. So to compensate for this, what I'm going to do is also push the shadows back up. So the shadows are not going to affect the highlights, but they're going to give me a more natural blue in the sky, and they're also going to fix that problem on the horizon. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. If we add a little tiny bit of dehaze, it's going to add some contrast overall, and that's starting to look pretty good. I may want to pull the highlights down just a little bit more to get those yellows back. So I'm going to toggle this off. I'm going to click on the gradient button. I'm going to go back to the global settings here, and I may just want to pull the shadows up a little bit more for good measure. Let's add a little bit more vibrance, and that looks pretty good. Next step, let's go ahead and bring this into Photoshop for additional editing. I'm going to right-click again. I'm going to say Export, Export with Previous. It's going to bring it right into Photoshop for editing. Here we are back in Photoshop once again with my base layer. Before I go any further though, what I'm going to do is go back into Lightroom and I'm going to reset this just by deleting everything. And I'll click off of the gradient and I'll set these just manually quickly back to zero because I want to export this into Photoshop as well. Export with previous and I'm going to use unique names. This is our base layer, unedited straight out of camera. I'm going to select all, copy, close, and paste so that we can just see before, straight out of camera, after raw adjustment in Lightroom. Now that both these layers are in Photoshop, I'm going to select them both, just like last time, drag it to the new group. And what I usually do is I'll call this blend or base layers, just to stay organized. And what I'm going to do is drag that to duplicate, use Command E, which again, merges these layers into one. Once it's a layer, I can go up just like last time, filter the next step that I like to use, the camera raw filter. First of all, let's adjust it globally. I think that the white balance came off a little bit cool here. The sky looks good. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and warm that up just a little bit. I may also want to add just a little bit of contrast. While we're at it, let's just globally bump the vibrance just a hair, just a little bit of fine tuning here. Now what I'm going to do is actually do some selective adjustments. Let's start with the foreground here, all the way up to the sky. Going to want to reset those adjustments. Now the first thing I want to do is address the white balance issue. We have some warm light on the top here, and we have some cool light on the top of the sky. So what I'm going to do is adjust the temperature until I feel like that warmth is being reciprocated or bounced here on the foreground below. The other thing that I want to do is bring the exposure up a little bit. Now, if I start to mess with the exposure, I have to be careful because I don't want it to touch the sky. So what I'll do is I'll just bring this gradient down so it never touches the highlights here. In fact, let's keep it comfortably out of those highlights. Now, since I have the highlights deselected in the sky, let's go ahead and bring them back in the foreground. I think we have some room here to bring these highlights and whites up. And that looks pretty good. Let's also add a little bit of dehaze just to pop the contrast a little bit. Let's give us a little bit more deep contrast. And you know what? I'm just going to adjust this temperature just a little bit, make sure I have it exactly how I want it. And I'm also going to bring the shadows up in the foreground here, just while I have everything but the sky selected. Next thing I want to do is add a complementary gradient on the top here to adjust the sky. Again, I'm going to want to reset that because just like last time, I want to cool down 
this sky. So I want the top to be nice and cool. And what I want to do is cool down the sky a little bit. I want those blues to come back. And I'll also pull the shadows up a little bit just to adjust those blues themselves. So that's starting to look pretty good. Now what I'm going to do is take this one step further by introducing a new tool. Similar in that it is a selective adjustment tool, but it's actually an ellipse. It allows us to select a circular or elliptical area. First thing I'm going to do is a reset local corrections and then I'm going to show you if I change the exposure here you can see it's just inside of that ellipse which is really nice. So this gives me the ability to change the temperature so I can warm up that part of the sky and maybe into some of the bottom of this image without upsetting the blue that I just set. I can also go in and add a little bit of dehaze to give it a little bit more contrast in those clouds. I can also pull the shadows up just a little bit. Now that actually looks pretty good. From here I can actually tint it if I want more of a purple sunset. You can see that's changing it, making it a little bit more fiery red. Uh, I wouldn't go the green side. That's going to make it a little more yellow and orange. But here between the temperature and the tint, this is done completely to taste. You can create sort of a custom color profile that you want the warmth of the sun to be based on. Let me go ahead and go back to the global settings here. Just in case there's anything else I want to tweak, this is when I go ahead and add a little bit more contrast, a little bit more dehaze, or change the exposure globally. But looking at the histogram, it actually looks pretty good. None of my shadows are clipped, and everything seems to be coming together nicely. So let's go ahead and click OK. Now that looks pretty good. You see the before and after. So we already did a very big leap from here to here, but you can see with the color corrections here, we're starting to get back to a true life scene. So let me zoom in. Now again, remember that other area down here that we talked about, which is those rocks. Now again, this is up to you if you want to get rid of these elements or if you have any distracting elements in your scene, but I'm going to go ahead and do that very quickly by using the clone stamp tool that's S on the keyboard, and I'm actually just going to go ahead and quickly paint these out just like last time I know exactly where I need to click, exactly what I need to reference from, and exactly how much I need to paint these out. So it's really easy. And truth be told, I should have done it in the last step, but again I haven't gotten that far in editing, so it's pretty easy to just fix this on the fly right now. Now speaking about on the fly, let's take a look up here. There are no flies. So pun intended, the flies actually went away when the sun went down. Thank goodness because you saw that actually took a lot of time to remove them. So I don't really have any things to worry about here. And since I wasn't shooting directly into the sun, or rather I'm shooting into the direction the sun is fallen in the sky, I'm not actually shooting directly into the sun itself. So you can see the clarity of the scene is much better and better intact than the last version was. So now this is all starting to look pretty good. I'm going to merge this. So if I do that, I'm going to actually take this layer and this layer, select them, Command E. Again, I can do that up here with the Merge Layers command, but Command E is the hotkey. From here, the next step is local adjustments. Again, using the same technique I showed you before. Let's say I wanted to brighten up the foreground a little bit. I could do that with the curves. I can add a little bit of contrast in that curves and then adding a gradient will allow me to lock it right in just into the area that I want to correct. Now these are basically micro adjustments. They're small adjustments to the scene either using gradients or paint brushes or anything else like that. Same thing with global contrast. It's nice to have it on adjustment layers. We can actually pull the contrast up globally this time. We can add a little bit of contrast to the entire scene. Now to take this one step further than last time, what I'm going to do is show you the technique I use to sharpen my landscapes. I like to use something called a high pass filter. A high pass filter is actually very simple to use, but it requires having a duplicate of the image itself. So let's go ahead and turn these off. Those aren't important. Or even if you just leave them on, what is important is we take our most recent edit, our most recent layer, and we duplicate it. Drag and drop it to this icon itself. Now, if you want to use a hotkey instead, you can use Command J on a Mac or Control J and that'll make a new layer. What we're going to do here, with this new layer selected, we're going to go up to Filter, Other, High Pass. Right now it's going to look pretty strange. If I change the radius, you can see that it looks like a very bad HDR picture, so don't do that. What we're actually going to do is try to find edges. You can see that in this little square here, and if I were to zoom into this image, you can see that it's finding the edges of the image for me. 
It's different than a fine edge command where it's actually putting a shade, a light shade and a dark shade around the edges. So for 50 megapixel images, I would say the radius between three and five works pretty well. Five at an extreme, four is something pretty good. So four being the middle of three and five, let's go ahead and go with that. And I'm gonna zoom in to show you exactly what this layer looks like. You can see that it's finding all these edges. With this layer selected, obviously we can't use it like that. I'm gonna use a blending mode called overlay. Now you can use a couple different blending modes and some people like to teach it a different way, but I tend to use overlay. So if I click on overlay, you can see that it seems to have disappeared. But if I turn that layer on and off, you can see the tremendous amount of sharpening that it's applying. Let's actually zoom in and take a look at that. Look at this image now and look at it before. Well, the image itself was already razor sharp. You can see that this layer adds an incredible amount of detail and sharpness to the image. The thing is, I don't wanna sharpen the sky itself. The problem is, if there's any noise in the sky, and I'm gonna zoom in, you can see that noise happening there, the noise from the camera. If I turn this off, you can see it disappear. So what I wanna show you guys is an easy way to sharpen just the landscape and nothing that shouldn't be soft. So we can agree that the landscape looks a little bit better, sharper, I like that, but we don't want it to be in the sky and of course the water should be soft, shouldn't have any extra noise. So what I'm gonna do is create a mask and I'm going to paint a gradient from white to black. And then I'm gonna press the backslash key, enter Ruby Lith mode and you can see that I've painted this area out. If I select the paintbrush, that's B on the keyboard, I can actually paint black here. So I can go ahead and paint this out. So I don't want any of the water to be sharp. And really quickly, I'm just gonna paint that out. It doesn't have to be precise because you can feather these edges of the brushes. And it'll just kind of blend itself right in to the background. So some areas will be sharp. You can go very low paced if you wanna maybe not sharpen the infinite background, things like that. Very, very easy to quickly add sharpening. So if I click on that again, Ruby Lith will disappear and I'm left with a tack sharp image right in the foreground. Now what I'm going to do, now there are so many things that I could do, little micro adjustments, changing the greens on the left, adding warmer tones here in the highlights or offsetting the shadows so that we have variation of color and tone. But since this is just an introduction to editing, what I want to focus on is just one more technique that I like to use in landscape photography. And that's a classic technique, actually, a very old technique called dodging and burning. And since I already introduced the high pass filter and the overlay mode, I want to show you guys how to quickly be able to redistribute or accentuate light and shadow in the scene. So what I'm going to do, instead of clicking the new layer button, which we've done before, I'm going to hold Alt or Option on the Mac and click Create New Layer. I'm gonna name it dodge slash burn. Now, if I just create a layer, it's gonna be a normal layer, but it wants to know if I wanna do anything special. Well, I can change the blending mode to overlay. And when I change it to overlay, it's gonna ask me if I wanna fill overlay with a neutral 50% gray. If I say okay to that, it's gonna create a layer that, guess what, is completely completely transparent. Now that's because everything 50% gray when set to overlay mode disappears. But if I happen to brush white on here, it would actually create a highlight. If I brushed black, it would actually create a shadow, thus dodging and burning the image. Now that's a very extreme example, so let me just go ahead and undo that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my flow very low to something like five, and I'm gonna pull the opacity down. And what I'm actually gonna do is start to brush in highlights and shadows. So I'm gonna be able to accentuate some of the lighting that's missing from the scene. Since the sun was behind it, it's backlit, it doesn't have any real front light or intense lighting. But what I can do here with the paintbrush tool, and here I want you guys to take a look at my palette. This is the foreground and background color. Right now it's black and white, but if I hit X on the keyboard, it actually rotates that or I can click this little arrow right here. And that allows me to quickly paint white, hit the X key, quickly paint black. Zoom in a little bit and I'm just going to quickly start painting some highlights in. So let's go ahead and bring these highlights here in that stripe of earth. Let's go ahead and come down here. And where we have these natural highlights, 
I just want to make them a little bit more intense. So this gives you the ability to sometimes completely redistribute the light in a scene, but in this case just accentuate some of the natural lighting that's already there. So we know we're getting a lot of lighting here. We may want a little bit more light here on the water itself from the sky. It's going to bring this in. Some of this natural area here looks like it would pick up highlights very well. Even back here, maybe in the background, close to that sunspot, all the way across here. And then you can even do these global moves like this, or you can zoom way in and you can chisel out little detail, just little areas like this. We can bring these little areas to life. Dodging and burning is really fun. It gives you a lot of flexibility over the look and feel of the final image. Now, so far I've just been dodging. I'm gonna go ahead and dodge some of this. But if I wanted to, I can also darken areas up too. Hit X on the keyboard, swap to black, and I can also start to darken some of these make it a little bit more intense, make the shades vary a little bit more. And you can see here on this platform, the sort of plateau, I can make it a little bit darker. Same thing here in the greens. Accentuate the greens, some of the dark areas here. And I can just kind of have fun with it. And it looks pretty nice. So let's go ahead and back off that a little bit. And what I'm gonna do is just bring this closer to the center here. And I'm gonna toggle the dodge and burn layer on and off. So you can see that it actually creates a little bit more drama in the scene. Really nice thing about dodge and burn layer is you can paint on it in different varying levels of opacity to intensify or decrease the effect, but you can also change the opacity overall. So if I thought that was too intense, I can just bring it up when I'm done, add a little tiny bit, maybe 66%, you can see now, or even less than that, let's say like around 50-ish percent. And you can see that we have a little bit more of a dynamic lighting environment created. At this stage, there are a lot of things that I can do, a lot of things that I still wanna to do to this image, but this should have given you a great idea of how far we can push these raw files from the Fujifilm GFX 50S in post-processing. Just like the file before, let's take a look at the progression. So we started out here with just this image. I'm gonna zoom it out here so that I have it completely in frame. This was straight out of camera. So this was straight out of camera, you can see it's almost like there's nothing in the foreground. But with some quick adjustments in Lightroom, we were able to take it from here to here. Again, it came out a little flat, so using the Adobe Camera Raw filter inside of Photoshop, we took it from here to here. So a tremendous difference in the color tone. We also removed some of the rocks. From there, we added sharpening using a high pass filter, dodge and burn, and a couple color corrections using adjustment layers. And if I turn all those on, we went from here to here. Now that's starting to look really nice. Well that about wraps it up here in the studio. I hope you guys have enjoyed this tutorial from Horseshoe Bend all the way shooting with the GFX 50S by Fujifilm and all the way through post-processing. If you're curious about photographing the world and you'd like to learn more from my tutorials, visit the store at fstoppers.com. If you want to know more about me, some of the work that I create, the places I travel to, and of course, more free tutorials and online content, visit eliahlocardi.com. So with that, it's time for me to get out of the studio and back out in the field so I can capture some more images all over the world.